Otherwise, it'll just be the Feige Bomb show. And then I'll just say, more interestingly, nuance. More interestingly, nuance. <laughs> it's like a soundboard. Yeah. <laughs> If there was like motor weakness, then that's like a clear indication for. Right. When you just have the sensory symptoms, if I mean again, if it was me, I would continue training to the extent that I could train. Yep. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about special or specific stuff you have to do for your laminectomy, low back. You can deadlift, wear a belt, keep your back heard, flat the way we had you pull today. I heard you were talking about stuff. Yeah. Is this limited to some extent? Well, so he was a 61-year-old spine surgeon with a three-level laminectomy and then cervical neck fusion. So just imagine I'm training this guy, right? And I'm like, okay. Also, he was the dad of the girl I was dating at the time. I'm like, do I kill him or do I not kill him? <laughs> well, unsure, like, what to do here. Um, yeah, but we ended up working up, I think he got 275, three sets of five on the squat. Uh, the thing that happened was every time he got over 300 for sets of five on a deadlift, he would tweak his back like every other week. So we had him do a rack pulls, low rack pulls, just so he didn't have to go all the way to the floor. But what that, whether that was due to his laminectomy or cervical neck fusion or, or old decrepitude in relation to that, or that fact that he was a surgeon, you know, and had something else going on, I don't know. So that's one training modification we made just because he showed me that he could not train his deadlift productively and consistently. And so rather than just scrap the deadlift, I just had him pull from the rack and we were able to add weight, titrate up like that. So for you, until you have motor signs, I'd probably just train like, you know, your 25 year old guy, just hang it out. And statistically, it's gonna get better. Yeah. Yeah, the, it, the sensory is it gets worse. Right, exactly. So that was the thing, you know, uh, uh, one of my former clients has similar issue like this and, you know, but she had fasciculations and muscle wasting and, weakness and everything else like that and now it's a clear indication for repair you know but it was interesting that some of the other professionals around her were like well maybe we can like rehab this and it's like you've declared yourself injured that has a specific fix with the fix needs to occur you know but, but I think without any motor signs then you're kind of like you're in that gray zone and you know and then it becomes more of a patient preference kind of thing yep right so I would just how willing to... are you to get surgery on your neck you know if it was me I'd probably hold off as long as I could uh, and, and train and hope that it does get better, especially with the knowledge that you now have about how this stuff works. <laughs> Should I have a protein shake before I go to bed to trigger a, another Hell yeah! Hey! <laughs> it's great. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a great, well, so I'm very proud. One, because you said muscle protein synthesis. Speaking our language. Yeah, it's great. And then two, because you're thinking about this. So that, that's great. Uh, yes. If, so one, uh, let's say you were trying to hit 200 grams of protein per day, all right? And you were loosely sort of calculating this in your head, and after dinner, you were at 170 grams for the day total, then absolutely 100% I would have a protein shake three hours later prior to bed if you were still awake, all right? That situation changes under two scenarios. Scenario number one, let's say you're at 200 grams of protein for the day, that's your goal for the day, and you just finished dinner, you're up for another three hours, what do you do? Nothing, just go to bed, it's fine. Or, let's say you're at 180 grams protein for the day, right, and it's one hour until bed. Do you have another, do you have a shake prior to going to bed? Nope, just go to bed. Chalk it up, do better next time. Well, I'm serious, because there's no benefit from taking the shake at that point, right, and you're eating legitimately directly before bed, which then I start to worry about you having gastro, uh, like reflux type symptoms, may keep you awake, which ultimately compromise your gains any more than 20, missing 20 grams of protein for the day, yeah. right? So those are the three scenarios that I would imagine. I've another doctor to look at. I have all, this, all these case studies that show this bullshit. It's still recommended. 
Yeah, well, so there's a lag period though, right? So we know that for every intervention that like physicians used to do, well, so, so um, here, here, let me give you two scenarios. So for every, situa every situation where we've had a medical reversal, right? We were doing one thing and then the data overwhelmingly showed that that was the bad thing. But there's a lag period where people still do the messed up thing just from convention. We don't know why they do it other than that's what they've always done and that's how they were trained. And a bad a flu just needs to come along and take care of the slow adopters, <laughs> right? But you worry about being an early adopter and being wrong. So on the other hand, you understand. What's more frustrating is people without the level of training, uh, like professional training, and sort of uh, research background to have undertaken such an endeavor as this, who will on the internet run or type a lot and dismiss all of your work because they heard a podcast from somebody who mentioned in passing some certain thing, right? That's the more frustrating thing, and I think cooler heads prevail. Uh, I have found that people who really know their stuff don't tend to get worked up terribly much. They just say, yeah, well, the good thing about science is it's true whether you believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, you know, so it, it's, you, people are, can still be passionate, but when people start using ad hominems or personal attacks or you know, all sorts of stuff like that, then you're like, Either you're really like emotionally invested in this sort of thing, or you don't know it very well, you know. So that's my personal take on it. Yeah, I don't have a ton to add to that. It's a frustrating topic, for sure. <laughs> yeah. You end up in the same boat. So, not exactly. You can start. I don't want to dominate this thing. <laughs> so we talked a lot about uh, the concept of training volume being a major kind of driving force in these various adaptations, right? And so, one of the things we talked about was how, uh, you know, ideally we can get novices to go through the novice progression. If they're doing it for the purpose of following a secondary or a more important goal, right, then you have an, uh, other factors to consider, which for you might be playing hockey, I guess, right? We'd like to get you through the novice progression to the extent we can while maintaining you have to keep practicing your sport, presuming you're in season and stuff like that, right? And so if you're talking about, when you say balancing the strength and the conditioning, if you're talking about playing your sport, being the conditioning side of things, which you are, right? Well, that you're essentially, you came into your strength training already doing that. So you're kind of presumably somewhat adapted to doing that level of conditioning, right? When we start you on the novice program, everything's super light. Right? It's going to be mild, mildly challenging. We'll work it up over time, and you're going to adapt to this stuff. So that's the thing is people, as, as we mentioned when we talked about the whole volume sensitive discussion, people can adapt to training volume. You'll get better at it. It's not that you get stronger, you're like wickedly more powerful on the, on the, on the ice, and then you're more wrecked because you're so powerful because you were strength training. Does that make sense? I'll take you through, I'll take you through. So you you need more information. I need more information to tell you what to do. So, how many hours a week do you have to train? Um, probably about eight. eight. So let's say you have that's a significant amount of time to train, all right? And you're telling me that your conditioning is an issue, all right? So I would dedicate the, probably close to an hour and a half of your time, your weekly time, to general conditioning. So general conditioning would be rower, running, cycling, ski erg, anything like that that's not skating, okay? You do one day per week of lower intensity, steady state, you know, this might be 30 minutes at a heart rate of 120, something like that. And then another session would be high intensity interval training where every second minute, or every two minutes rather, you would do a 20 to 30 second sprint. Again, on one of those, one of those modalities. They usually don't like sprints. Uh, on land for non-sprinters, like running, because you end up hurting yourself. Uh, but on a bike, on a rower, on a skier, something like that, you'd be fine, okay? Then I would spend the other 30 minutes, at a minimum, maybe up to an hour, doing skating, where you would just be skating. And maybe, you know, skate for 10 minutes at a moderate pace, take a break for five minutes, do it again, That's your, and then you do that twice, and effectively that's your specific conditioning. 
right? And all of that stuff is recoverable from, especially if we titrate it up. You may find that week one, you're like, Jordan, I did that and I'm wrecked. Well, that just tells me I was over aggressive on week one, and so we need to, let's go half of that and then titrate up from there. As for your strength training stuff, I don't know what you're doing from a programming standpoint right now. And how old are you? 41. You're 41, what are you doing for programming right now? Um, it's pretty much just a early year program, sliding you know, twice a week. Okay. Match drives. Yeah. What's it called? Does that have a name? No, well, so I'm working with a coach. Oh, okay. So I'll see you right now. All right. As long as it's not Texas method, then we're fine. No, no, it's not. All right, good. I thought when he looked down at the floor, it was like five three one. I was like, does have a number? What is it? Um, so, so your strength training, you may not even change it, right? But if your strength training is revolving around limit sets, yes. And what I mean by that is, you know, at the end, the end of that set, you've got left one rep or less left in the tank more often than not, then I think that is unsustainable and inappropriate. Okay and is likely, would likely be contributing to your lack of recovery resources that you, you would need to dedicate to, to conditioning, all right? Similarly, this wouldn't look the same year round. As the season's about to approach, guess what's gonna go up? Your resources dedicated towards conditioning, right? Simultaneously, you'll have less time to train in the weight room, it doesn't mean you can't get stronger, okay? It just means you're, you're just balancing these two things. So as far as specifically how to do all of that, you know, I think that's- Consultation. Yeah, I mean, I'll bill you. <laughs> or talk to your coach about it, but I don't think you should be afraid of conditioning. Especially when, when one of the reasons why you train is probably so you can be better at hockey. Yeah. So, in any event, don't be afraid of conditioning. But it's going to be titrated up over time, and tell your coach. And you'll keep adapting. Yeah. And if you stop adapting, you're dead. You're dead. <laughs> so. how, how, how bad do you have to be messing this up to the contract? That's, a, that's actually a super interesting question, and I'll, I'll definitely let Austin you know, say something on this. I mean, I know what Jordan's going to say, so I can go ahead and just say that. Yeah, say it. Yeah, say it. You said that's a what? I said I already know what Jordan's going to say on the topic. He's going to cite the data compiled Are you going to say the new jump No, no, no. No, no. 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 so what he's going to cite is the data that was compiled by Dr. Reculia from the training logs on the Starting Strength Forum where people who are presumably interested in training using the method and the program tried to do so uh, and went and logged their training and he found that like 2% or less of the people who were maintaining training logs there were actually doing any, like anything within 80% of the program, what could be called the program, and uh, they all made huge progress. Yeah. So his data showed that these people who were self-selected Based on interest in doing the program, 98% of them screwed it up still. and still made tons of progress. The interesting thing is there are no non-responders. Yes. There were no non-responders and any exercise-based study that you look around where they say, oh, how do people on average perform? There's a group of non-responders. There were none, even if they screwed it up. Yeah. So you'd have to screw it up really bad. <laughs> you'd have to do a really, really bad job. You'd have to try. Yeah, you like try. One way to screw it up, which I don't think you're doing, is to be the person who says, I'm gonna stick with this weight until my form is perfect. Yep. A great way to screw it up is to never add weight to the bar. Yep. Because then you're objectively making no progress. Right. So to the extent that you're adding weight to the bar, you're close. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think it's gonna be hard to maintain, you know, hundred percent peak performance to the level that you've developed that by just doing maintenance. Right? At some level that's going to decay because you're not keeping up with the sort of stress, recovery, adaptation uh, sort of cycle. And, you know, but even if you didn't want to dedicate any more time to it, you just wanted to dedicate three hours a week, that's a workable time frame. The programming's just going to change. Yeah. The input's going to change, but you can still get better three hours a week. I mean, I was, run, I was working 80 hours a week in the hospital, plus running barbell medicine, plus, you know, chasing tail in LA, all right? And still somehow managed to have really productive training, you know? And I was giving myself four hours a week to train. That's true, but I'm not doing that to, I'm not saying that, saying that to brag, I'm just saying that even, you know, when pressed against the wall, like, if, you know, backs against the wall, you can do some pretty amazing stuff. So I have no doubt in my mind, given what I saw from you on the platform, that you can continue to go do great things. Yeah. There you go, I'll be your hype man. You! Yeah. <laughs> it's your boy! <laughs> <laughs>
squat range for total, total reps that you like? Like total volume. Yeah, work, work. Oh, yeah, so. Set, work reps. This is a concept that was like set forth by uh, Mike Rizzichel, like this maximum recoverable volume, you know, sort of theory. Now, I don't think that there is a bunch of good evidence on this, so I'm going to speak more abstractly, okay? Because I don't know how many reps is enough minimum threshold, and I don't know how many reps are too much, other than if during the novice progression, for instance, you're adding weight to the bar, right? And presumably, during the novice progression, you are getting the max hypertrophy response. And after, after. Yeah, well, so, so what I'm saying is you're getting 15 reps, working reps per session. So then after the novice progression, if you're looking to maximize hypertrophy, it's going to have to be more than that. How much more than that is gonna depend on your recovery resources that you have available. So I think that's going to be dependent on, on those. Um, again, my default, my default is to start in that sort of eight to 12 rep range for two hard sets. But I'm doing that multiple times per week. But let's just say that somebody wanted to start training <coughs> arms, right? They didn't, oh, do yeah. it on, they didn't do it on novice progression, they want to do it as an intermediate and we're looking to maximize hypertrophy. Well, I might start them with two hard, hard sets of 12 if they're gonna dedicate, like, train it on a rep scheme. Or I'll say, hey, start a timer, six minutes, you're doing as many curls as possible in sets of eight to 12, all right, with minimal rest in between, and your idea is to add reps to that every time that you do it, or go up and wait. You progressively overload that. And I might start them doing that twice per week, and then eventually it's gonna be more and more. And if, again, if at some point, this is somebody's like, look, I wanna be an IFBB pro bodybuilder, I'm like, hey man, go find I think you, I think I need to refer. That's just not my, that's not my expertise. But for general jacketude, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely more than 15. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or smaller shirts. Yeah, or smaller shirts. I found Baby Gap. <laughs> baby Gap is good. Armani Exchange. You know, so this is actually a true story. So I missed my flight. I missed my flight out of SFO uh, on Thursday to come down here. And so I, anyway, I was down in San Jose at Santana Row. They have a uh, uh, Ted Baker store there. Ted Baker is like a London, like from London. Anyway, European people are smaller than we are. And the lady was like, oh no, you're a seven. And I thought she was telling me that I looked like a seven. I was like, come on, man. Like, I know it's been a rough day, but come on. So it, it, it's the size. Anyway, so I put on this seven shirt, which is like an XL, right? And as I was putting it on, I ripped the sleeve. <laughs> which, that basically picked me up after being called a seven. So, yeah. So, smaller shirts sometimes are the answer, but also a dangerous game. Yeah. What's that?